so I went home and as I was heading towards the back door of the ship, there was a lady stood outside the door and uh, I said, what, what are you doing? What, what's the matter? And she just looked at me and she said, the lifeboat's gone and they're all dead. We both uh, came down, we came out onto the harbour front in Mausel and the wind was absolutely screaming. There was, a, there was a noise in the air that I've never heard since. And two 10 year old lads and we literally were darting from doorway to doorway in between the gusts. It's the only way, we, if, if we got caught in a gust, we would have ended up blown into the harbour. It was so windy. And after we tried a few times to make headway and we realised we couldn't. I said to him, there's only one thing we can do, we're going to have to go back home. I opened the back door and both my brother Neil and Dad were putting on their, they both had their r and i jumpers on. Um, Dad was putting on his jacket, Neil was putting on his thigh boots and uh, I just said to them, I said, where are you going? And Dad said, lifeboat's been called. Matter of fact, it's happened hundreds of times before. I've seen him putting his gear on hundreds of times before. And I went, okay, see you later, and went upstairs, and that was the last time I saw him. He came across my, past my bedroom, because we had like a flat above the pub. We lived in the ship, and upstairs, our accommodation was like a flat, so it was all one level. And he came past my bedroom, and he turned around and just, I didn't even open the door, I just shouted through the door. And I shouted, you all right, then? He said, yeah, I've got to shout. And I said, have you got your fags? because he was a smoker and he'd forgotten on the trip before and he was like a bear with a sore hand. So he said, yeah, got my fags. I said, see you later. He said, cheers, yeah, bye. Gone. Didn't think anything of it. Went to a nightclub, got back about quarter to one in the morning and the first I knew was somebody was standing on the cliff and they turned around. Uh, I jumped out of the taxi with Kevin and other friends and it was really unusual There's people stood on the cliff. So uh, I said, what are you doing? You know, everything all right? And, I said, and this gentleman said to me, no, go home, your mum needs you. The next thing I remember is, I guess, six, seven, eight o'clock next morning with my mum waking me up and trying to tell me, a 10 year old lad, that you're not going to see your dad again. And it was just like surreal. It really was. I just, I think it took probably two or three days for me to understand what was going on. Well, I was only 12. And I was actually staying at a mate's house, um, so I didn't know what was going on until the morning when I went home. And my dad had gone to sea on another fishing boat um, to go and look for survivors. Um, and that was the first I heard about it. And then I think we actually drove to Maisel to find out what was gone. And I just remember seeing all the families out, just waiting for news and people crying in the streets and everything. So yeah, it was horrible. It's an eerie place. and. I think it's probably one of the worst places that boat could have gone in for, for sea room. There wasn't any. And trying to, you know, I try and visually picture it in my brain what it would, must have been like that night. And it, you know, I just can't, I can't co comprehend what they had to go through, really. And the fact that they managed to get four off was, must have been absolutely amazing. But still not give up. And to go back, you know, and try again, it's just, yeah. Well, they paid the ultimate price, didn't they? But yeah, they're just amazing what they tried to do. But the village had a very strange feeling. I mean, it, they were still blowing a gale. Um, there were helicopters going to and fro, multiple helicopters. You could see boats out in the bay because half the fishing fleet in Newland went out um, searching. And there were clusters of families all around the harbour front. And, and you just looked down and you could see them and we could see you know, a little bit down from where we was, was the sort of the next family. And then, the, uh, you know, 20 yards along was the next cluster of families. People going between them, but everyone was just stood there looking out to sea. Nobody was saying anything. It was really surreal. It was very strange. And that happened for a couple of days, I guess. Most of the men were out searching the cliff tops and, and doing what they could do. But um, like I say, the families were, um, were in the, uh, uh, you know, the women and children, so to speak. Um, we're just in the village. So the media we were really quick to arrive, naturally, and it felt like they invaded the village. Um, and so obviously living in the pub, the pub was open 
and the media were all in the pub. The first two or three days was sort of relatively unusual and weird, um, but when it hit the public press, um, particularly on the Monday and the Tuesday, and then we started getting swamped with TV crews and all sorts of things, and we were really having uh, dinner, we sat at the dinner table having dinner, and the door swings open and in walks the press. They just walked into our house. They switched the lights off after the disaster. Um, the, the day before the disaster, Charlie Greenoff actually switched the lights on. He was the VIP that switched the Christmas lights on. They switched them all off. That went on for, I guess, round about probably till maybe Christmas Eve. And then two or three uh, of the widows got together and said, look, to the Christmas lights committee, you know, the children don't understand, switch the lights back on. So the lights came back on. And that was important as well, I think, because they didn't break that tradition, they kept that tradition going. I think it was days, wasn't it? I think within a couple of days, I think more vol extra volunteers had come forward. They, Kenny Thomas was then appointed to the next coxswain. Um, I think they got one up to pool and got the, the old St Mary's guy, Clay Hunter. So she was on service within a few days. So yeah, it was amazing after, after that initial horrendous loss that they were still willing to you know, put their hands up and get the lifeboat back in back in action again so it's amazing really one of the biggest things and the most important things is the fact that they didn't take the lifeboat away from us after the disaster they didn't say right penny you've lost the lifeboat that's it no they replaced the lifeboat and we had a new crew brother was part of that crew um which is is, is really really great because obviously he went on to be coxswain and I'm really really proud of that um and that's important to us um you know, that big hub of the community carried on, which was important. I always think it's a, bit of it's a lot of responsibility to uphold the standards that have been set before you. you know, going back 40 years, it was a predominantly, or it was entirely male crew that were at a seafaring background. Whereas now we've got a lot more diverse crew. We got a right variety of of trades, very very little maritime background, but we've still got to try to uphold the same standards and professionalism of our forebearers. There's, there's a few things that the community circles around. You've got the chapels uh, and you've got the, the pubs and stuff, but the lifeboat is definitely one of the things that the community circles around. And it's evident because whenever the lifeboat came into the harbour over at Mausel, whether it be on a lifeboat day or there's something going on, some fundraising and somebody's got a, a, a barbecue or something on the quay or whatever, as soon as that lifeboat appears, the village will just empty out and come down the quays to look at it and there would be hundreds of people all desperate to get aboard and just have a look on the lifeboat. We, we come into work and the crew are there on the wall you know so it's the first thing you look at when you get in so you know we're, I sort of think about it most days because we're I'm in the Penny lifeboat station we've got models of the Solomon Brown we've got the pictures of the crew on the wall so it's, for me it's um the um, the big years don't make much difference to my sort my thoughts on it yeah we you know we do our on the day we, we go out and we lay a wreath with the families, we go to the memorial service, we do pay our respects, but I think we sort of think about what happened most days. Is that legacy, you know, we've got that, as I've been talked about the one night, but we've got over 200 years of history at Penley. Um, we are the centre of the community, um, yeah, and it's to uphold the traditions and keep the, keep the station on service. Part of the, um, what we do on the anniversary is supporting those those people because they you know they commit their lives even though they've lost people they loved ones and people they grew up with they've committed their lives to fund to fundraise and be part of the iron life still. If I don't say it and tell people my story, it'll die with me. So and I'm the next generation that will remember because I was there and then after that after me it's gone. And um, where I live now is. Um, in between Newlyn and Mousel and I've got a beautiful view of the sea and I watch Patch take that boat past me often when it's a shout and I still get that chill in my spine when I watch him go past and it still makes me hold my breath for him. <laughs>